Good evening, everyone. So, welcome. Uh, my name is David Harris, um, and I want to welcome you here to Harvard Law School on behalf of Harvard, uh, the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. You can't hear, but if I get close, I'm getting feedback. Okay. Um, so, again, you know, those of you who know us know this is our, our kind of normal starting time, so uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. We're really thrilled to have you here. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, our co-sponsors for this event. We have quite a few, and they have all uh, contributed, uh, both in terms of time and resources, and really want to give a shout to them. We have the Coalition for Effective Public Safety, CEPS, uh, which has done uh, an incredible amount of work, the Criminal Justice Policy Coalition, the Emancipation Initiative, uh, the Hugsey uh, Office of Student Affairs, uh, the New England Innocence Project, uh, the Prison Studies Project, the Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts, the Transformative Justice uh, Series, and a wonderful anonymous donor who made a great uh, donation uh, to, toward uh, the cost today. So as always, I want to mention a couple of upcoming events we have uh, from the Houston Institute on March 27th. Uh, Judge Richard Gergel uh, will be here to speak on a book he's done called Unexampled Courage, which is a study of a blinding of an African-American veteran following World War II and its impact on uh, uh, Harry Truman and the course of history. Uh, and on April 3rd, we'll have Anna Clark, a journalist who did a, a, a pretty important and riveting uh, look at the, the Flint water crisis. Uh, and I'm, I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Jean Tramstein, uh, who will introduce tonight's speaker. But before I do that, I want to take a moment uh, to speak about uh, a dear friend and colleague of ours, Lily A. Estes. Uh, Lily is very important to both Jean and me. Uh, she died on January 31st at the age of 59. Her, her loss leaves a gaping hole uh, for me personally, but also for the work that, that we do and that I believe in. My last, one of my last conversations with Lily, we talked about that proverbial door uh, that uh, it opens widely for some and is closed for others, and we think about our mission in life as being letting more people through that door or opening the door a little wider. But Lily and I talked about the need to tear that wall down that holds up the door. And that's what Lily did. Uh, Lily called herself a community strategist, but she was, in fact, uh, an incredible spirit and, uh, and devoted, devoted community activist. So I ask that we take a moment uh, to think about Lily and to think about renewing our own commitment to community justice, whether we're dismantling that wall brick by brick or with a pickaxe. Lily A. Estes. So welcome, everyone, again, and thanks for coming. Um, we had a great day today at the State House, and um, I want to thank Don Perry as well as Mark Maurer for participating in uh, so much great legislative work. Um, so a couple of things um, before I introduce our speaker. We have Mark's books for sale. We have SEP's sign-up sheets, Coalition for Effective Public Safety. We have some really important information on parole that we hope you will all take. And we have some wonderful art um, that Rachel Corey can tell you all about after the panel. So I invite you afterwards to look at everything, um, please. Excuse me? And we have cookies in the back. Thank you. <laughs> um, so 
I just want to give you an idea of how the evening is going to work. First, Mark is going to give a book talk, um, and then Radha Natarajan, did I get it right? Um, is going, is, from the Innocence Project, is going to interview him and talk to him about some particularly interesting issues of, uh, that are going on. Um, and then we have a panel, and the panel includes uh, Rachel, Rachel Corey, uh, Jessica Eagles, Sean Ellis, and Massachusetts State Rep. Jay Livingstone. And since we have this beautiful program, I invite you to read all about their bios rather than me tell you all about them so you can find out who they are. So that's the order. Then we'll have questions from the audience and a little time for social, socializing. So um, just a quick story about Mark. Um, when I was writing the first article I wrote on parole, I sort of, I just decided I was going to call the sentencing project. And I would just call them up and I would talk to the head of the sentencing project, Mark Maurer. And um, I did it sort of, you know, thinking, okay, well, I'll get somebody else on the phone. And I called up and I asked to speak to Mark Maurer and I said who I was, a person unknown to him, uh, working on an article on parole in Massachusetts. And Mark came to the phone. And he was fantastic and gave me information and told me where to look. And, and this is what the Sentencing Project, this is how I know the Sentencing Project. They are helpful, they have wonderful information, great reports, and are reliable. So with that, I want to introduce Mark Maurer, who is the Executive Director of the Sentencing Project. And I'm honored to have him here. Thank you. Okay, so at least I'm reliable, you know that much. So thank you, Jean, for that introduction too and all that. And uh, no, we, the reason we're so responsive is uh, criminal justice reform is not easy. I think you all know that. And we have to work with our allies all around the country at different levels and different positions of power or influence or advocacy. And, and that's how we see our role. And it's been, I think, very encouraging over the past decade in particular that I think the hard work so many people in this room and around the country have done in little by little ways is starting to pay off and opening the conversation about criminal justice reform and mass incarceration. Uh, first, to get one thing out of the way, um, you know, you came to hear a talk about the meaning of life. Um, if you think I'm going to tell you the meaning of life, uh, I can't do that for you. Um, but I can tell you something about life imprisonment uh, that my colleague Ashley Nels and I have, have just published a book and represents sort of the culmination of work we've done over the last 15 years. So let me begin by telling you a story uh, about a man uh, who lived 100 years ago named Robert Stroud. Um, Robert Stroud, 100 years ago, was uh, often viewed as one of the most dangerous men in America. He grew up in Seattle in a very abusive home. At the age of 13, he ran away to Alaska. Within a couple of years, he was working as a pimp. Uh, not long after that, he killed a bartender who he said owed him a debt and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Um, in prison, he continuously got into fights, many assaults against him and the like. And a few years later, in front of a 1,000 people at the prison cafeteria, he killed a prison guard who he said had uh, interfered with a visit from Stroud's brother there. Uh, he was sentenced to death for this second killing that he did. Uh, several years later, though, it was a federal offense. Uh, he received a commutation to life imprisonment. Uh, now, my guess is that not too many of you know the name Robert Stroud, but more of you may know him by his nickname, which was the Birdman of Alcatraz, a famous 1960s era film starring Burt Lancaster. Um, one day, Stroud was out on the prison yard and saw a wounded bird out there and brought the bird into his cell and studied it and nursed it back to health. And over the course of many years, and with the aid of a sympathetic warden who gave him 
some extra uh, cell block area. He had a, a, a various times over 300 birds that he studied and watched and took care of uh, and became one of the country's leading experts on bird behavior and development and the like. He published two books, many journal articles, and so on. Uh, and he was the Birdman of Alcatraz. Now, I think what's relevant to this story is uh, if you think back to the day of sentencing for the first murder or the second murder, uh, there was no one in the courtroom, judge, prosecutor, defense attorney, anyone else, who would have ever imagined that Robert Stroud would become a well-recognized scientific authority and make a contribution to uh, American science and in particular to understanding bird behavior. No one would have ever thought that. Uh, and when we talk about issues of life imprisonment, uh, we're essentially discounting that possibility of transformation that people can make, of growing up, of any change that we might think differently about the person who is being sentenced on that day for a very serious crime. So um, here's what I want to talk about, three uh, main themes. First, the trends in life imprisonment in the United States, how, where it's come from, how it's evolved. Secondly, its, imp its impact on mass incarceration and public safety. Uh, and third, following the theme of our book, how do we abolish life sentences? So life sentencing in the US in many ways has tracked with, been influenced by the development of mass incarceration, the tough on crime movement. Uh, before 1970, if we look just at life without parole, only seven states had a life without parole provision. Uh, many of you know this was leading up to 1972, the Furman case in the Supreme Court, which found the death penalty as it was carried out to be unconstitutional. And so a number of states started to adopt life without parole possibilities then as kind of a fallback position if that ban on the death penalty held up. Uh, well, it didn't hold up. Four years later, the Supreme Court allowed the resumption of executions under a different structure. Um, <clears throat> along came the 1980s, 1990s, really the height of the tough on crime movement. Uh, and as legislative bodies in every state and the federal government adopted tough on crime policies, mandatory sentencing, three strikes and you're out, restrictions on parole, the number of people serving life imprisonment started to soar quite substantially. Uh, many of you are probably familiar in the three strikes case. You know, about half the states have some type of three strikes policy. The original California legislation was by far the broadest because your first two strikes had to be serious or violent offenses as described in the statute, but your third strike could be any felony in the state. Uh, so the California policy was challenged as being representing cruel and unusual punishment in the case that came to the U.S. Supreme Court. 2003, there were two individuals. Uh, one of them, his third strike, involved stealing three golf clubs from a sporting goods store. He wore some baggy pants into the store, stuck the golf clubs in his pants, walked out, was immediately apprehended. Second man stole on two uh, close by occasions $153 worth of videotapes from a Kmart store. Uh, he was apprehended, sentenced as his third strike. The Supreme Court considered the argument, rejected their contention, and basically said if the legislature of California believes this is necessary to promote public safety, we don't want to second guess them. That's their decision to make. So the golf club thief had to serve his sentence of 25 to life and the videotape thief of 50 to life. Uh, this is what our policies have brought up. Uh, to be fair, California voters got smart finally about 20 years later uh, and scaled back the provisions of the law that allowed the third strike to be uh, any felony. Uh, I don't want to suggest that everybody serving life is there for stealing golf clubs and videotapes, but I think it's an indication as we have broad policies with very little thought going into them, uh, it shouldn't be surprising we get results like this. Uh, and the federal 
federal court system, the 1994 federal crime bill, brought us the federal three strikes policy so that uh, if you commit three uh, drug crimes in the federal system, you get life without parole. Uh, we know this very clearly because in President Obama's last two years in office in particular, he issued a total of 1,700 sentence commutations, more than 500 of which were life without parole sentences for a third time drug offense, life without parole for drug offense. And this by no means represented all of the cases in the federal system. These were the ones who got a commutation. Uh, so as we enhance sentencing, uh, for many years, legislators couldn't have enough of this and kept getting tougher and tougher. Um, sentencing scholar Michael Tonry at the University of Minnesota describes how just as mass incarceration is unique to the United States among developed nations, so is our uh, practice of habitual enhanced sentencing, habitual offender laws, three strikes, and the like, that other nations take prior convictions into account but in much more measured ways. They look at how close in time the convictions are. They essentially take an approach that you were already sentenced and did your time in that first one. Why do we have to sentence you again for the second one? So when there's different set of enhancements that are made, there are incremental ones, not nearly what we see uh, in this country. Uh, the life of population has grown because of changes in parole policy and practice. Uh, life for parole has become much more politicized in many states. Uh, governors are very reluctant to grant parole for lifers, thinking about their political prospects. Uh, many states' appointees of the governor are political friends or people with very little training in parole issues and uh, identification of how do you think about the behavior of the person before you and their risk for public safety. Uh, I got my start working on these issues some years ago in the state of Michigan uh, and ended up working a lot with lifers in the prison system there. Uh, at the time in Michigan, uh, if you were sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, uh, it was not unusual that if you had a good prison record, you would get out in 15 or 18 years. Uh, in recent years in Michigan, the parole board has taken the position that life means life. Now, <clears throat> what's important here is when the judge sends the person uh, on their life with the possibility of parole, judges were under the impression that life meant you might get out of 15 or 18 years, and the judges were comfortable doing that, and now the parole board is saying, no, that's not what we think has to happen. Um, parole boards, in many cases, have extended the waiting time between uh, parole setback, how many years you have to wait before you can come back for reconsideration, a whole set of practices like that. So where does that leave us today? Uh, well, if we look at the growth of lifers, uh, it's now the case that one of every seven people in prison is serving life imprisonment. One of every seven, either life with the possibility of parole, life without the possibility of parole, or what we call virtual lifers, <clears throat> which are sentences of 50 years or longer, so that many people will, in fact, die in prison on those virtual life sentences. It's a total of 206,000 people around the country. Uh, just to give some perspective on what this means, uh, <clears throat> there are now more people serving a life sentence than the entire prison population in 1970 in the United States. More people serving life. If we look internationally, you can compare the U.S. with the U.K., uh, if we look at life without parole, we have about five times the population uh, that the UK has. We have 1,000 times the number of people serving life without parole. Uh, also at the extremes, uh, the whole issue of juvenile life without parole. Uh, before the series of Supreme Court decisions over the last decade, 
there had been about 2,500 people serving life without parole for crime committed when they're under the age of 18. If you want to look at comparative data here too, we can look around the world and see what are the numbers of people who were uh, sentenced to such penalties in other nations, and the answer is two. There are two known cases in Australia. It's unheard of. No one has come across any other case. So we have 2,500. The rest of the world had two. So there are only two conclusions one can come to here. Either we have the 2,500 worst kids in the whole world doing all these bad things, or we are far more punitive than other nations are. OK, so that's, we have these record numbers of people. Life imprisonment has grown dramatically. Um, why is this a problem? After all, most of these people have committed serious crimes. That's in the name of public safety is why we're incarcerating them. Well, I think five problems in particular. Uh, first is the impact on mass incarceration. Uh, you know, we are all encouraged, I think, that the political environment on mass incarceration issues is finally opening up somewhat. We have a long way to go, but the conversation is different. We have people on both sides of the aisle in Congress talking about the need for types of reform in prison and sentencing. That's all very encouraging. Uh, in many cases, though, many state legislative bo bodies and others, um, there's this continuous search for what they sometimes call the low-hanging fruit, which often means uh, let's look at the first time low-level person convicted of a drug offense and get that person into a drug treatment program or some type of community supervision. Well, that's fine, of course. I don't have any problem with that. But most people in prison are not there for uh, a low-level first-time drug offense, or even any drug offense is not the majority. In state prisons, half the people there are currently serving time for a violent offense they were convicted of. So if we really want to end mass incarceration, or at least make a very substantial dent in it, we have to think much more broadly than just uh, these low-level offenses or people with minimal criminal histories. We have to take a look at serious crimes as well, which is not an easy thing to do, but we do need to do that if we really want to confront mass incarceration. Life imprisonment also is influential in promoting mass incarceration because of its impact on sentences across the board, not just for murder and robbery and the like. And the reason this comes about <clears throat> is that all sentencing structures, regardless of what kind they are, are proportional structures. So basically, we punish murder more severely than we do robbery, in turn more severely than we do car theft, and so on. They're proportional. Well, with the death penalty, with life without parole at the top of our scale of severity in the United States, what we see is that life sentences exert an upward pressure on sentences across the board, uh, much more so than in other uh, developed nations, which have a much lower ceiling, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of sentencing. So what this means is that even at the lower ends of offense severity, uh, if you get sentenced to prison in the US for your third car theft, you're going to do more time in prison than you would for the same crime in England, Italy, Germany, or any other industrialized nation, too. So the whole severity index is very much changed here. Um, thirdly, life imprisonment, I think, Provide, produces diminishing returns for public safety. Um, this may sound counterintuitive at first, because we would think if we lock up people who've committed very serious crimes, what else could that do but help to promote public safety? Uh, but the reason it's diminishing returns is because of what we know about involvement in crime with age. And criminologists have known for a long time that people age out of crime. Uh, if you look at all the charts on crime involvement and arrest, at the age of 14, 15, 16, young boys in particular, but girls as well, and this cuts across issues of race and class, 
their risk of being involved in criminal behavior starts to rise pretty precipitously and through the late teens and early 20s. But the good news is then it starts to come down quite significantly in the 20s, 30s, and certainly 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, I think all of us can think back to our mid-teen years. We probably did some things we're not very proud of now that we're remorseful about that may have been illegal at the time. Um, we don't do, most of us don't do those kinds of things today. We grew up, we take on adult roles, we have other responsibilities in life. So people age out of crime. So that means that if we have someone sentenced to prison for armed robbery at the age of 25, maybe getting a life sentence, by the time that person is 30, 35, 40, and certainly older, he or she is much less of a risk for being involved in criminal activity. So that means that each successive year that we keep someone in prison, we're getting less and less incapacitating benefit, if you want to think of it that way. Prison is doing less and less to prevent crime. And it's also coming at an increasing financial cost each year, because as people age in prison, just as on the outside, they have increased uh, health issues, medical costs, and the like. So we're preventing less crime. It's coming at a greater cost each year because of these dynamics. That, in turn, means that we're also diverting resources that we could better use for other public safety gains. Uh, you know, whenever I go to hear state legislators or people in Congress talk about some of these sentencing issues and criminal justice policies, uh, yes, there's some good discussion going on, um, but there's often just a belief that, you know, if we only just do a little bit more of this, this is going to work, and not much discussion about the trade-offs in one policy's effect on something else. So as we have 50, 60, and 70-year-olds uh, whose cost of incarceration is typically double or triple that of a younger person, um, that's money and resources that's not going into dealing with those 14, 15, 16-year-olds, some of whom are now at a higher risk of getting involved in some criminal behavior, some of it serious, some of it less so, uh, and where we could have much more of an impact on working with their families and communities to diminish the possibilities that some of them will be involved in this kind of activity. So we have to make a choice. Public safety resources are finite. How do we think we'll have the best benefit overall? We also know that um, life imprisonment, I think in many ways, violates human rights norms, international bodies and uh, bar associations and the like. Uh, a very significant case in Europe several years ago, the, uh, looking at life imprisonment, the European Court of Human Rights said that uh, prisoners need to have the right to hope the right to hope that if they change and transform, it will be recognized by society, they will have a chance to be released. Uh, here in the United States, the American Bar Association, the American Law Institute, have policies that basically say sentences should be no longer than necessary to achieve societal objectives. Uh, well, I think we're falling far short of those recommendations, those principles. Okay, so life imprisonment is problematic, I think, in many ways. Um, how do we abolish life imprisonment, as we say in the subtitle of our book? Um, it's not easy. Uh, let me just suggest a few things to think about in terms of strategies or, or approaches to thinking about this question. Uh, for one, uh, there's actually some encouraging uh, developments in terms of litigation, thinking about life sentences. Uh, again, many of you are familiar with the Supreme Court litigation around juvenile life without parole, three significant decisions over the last decade. Uh, the first one banned life without parole for juveniles in non-homicide cases. The second one said life without parole couldn't be imposed in a mandatory way for people under the age of 18. And the third one said that the 
second decision about mandatory sentencing had to be applied retroactively too. Uh, now the reasoning of the court uh, in these cases uh, in large part relied on the findings, the, the scientific findings that children are different. Uh, they have uh, less maturity than adults. They're more likely to be impulsive in their behavior, to not appreciate the consequences of their actions the way adults are expected to. So children are different, so we have to be cautious about imposing these most severe punishments are then. So that might be sort of discouraging because then it means if we want to extend that, uh, well, if children are different, then adults are not different, and what do we do? What's the strategy there? Um, it seems to me that adults are different too. Uh, if we look at people in prison, and if we look particularly at people serving extremely long sentences for serious crimes, uh, we know from many studies that the levels of trauma, abuse, exposure to violence, dysfunctional families and communities uh, are just widespread among these populations. Uh, this doesn't excuse their behavior, the terrible crimes some of them committed, but it should help us to at least understand something about where these crimes came from, these behaviors, and what might we do as a community to try to prevent this from happening in the first place, and maybe we should also consider some of these factors in terms of sentencing policy and how severe we think the response should be. So in our book, <clears throat> we lay out a proposal uh, that we should move to a system that has a 20-year maximum prison term except in unusual circumstances, an upper limit of 20 years in prison. Now, many people may think this is pretty provocative, especially in a country that's been through uh, leading the world and developing mass incarceration. Uh, but if we were having this conversation in Western Europe, it would not be terribly provocative at all. Uh, in most nations in Western Europe, either by statute or in practice, there are relatively few people serving life sentences. You know, I gave the example of the UK and how modest those numbers there. Uh, we have uh, countries like Norway, the t maximum sentence is 21 years uh, in practice or in law much smaller numbers. Um, when we look at this 20-year proposal, we make this proposal, again, based on a public safety approach and a human rights approach. The public safety approach is the aging out argument here, that most people in prison um, will age out, will not be the same risk to public safety after 20 years in prison. Uh, in the unusual circumstances case, the policy in Norway, which is one model to look at, uh, if a person is still deemed to be a risk to public safety after 21 years, they can be held for successive five-year periods in prison if it's deemed necessary. And those five-year periods are required to be devoted to providing rehabilitative programming, to preparing the person for a release, to deciding uh, how can we get this person back into the community. Uh, now, there are all kinds of questions about who makes the determination, what the composition of that board would look like and all. We go into the, some of the possibilities in the book, and it's, <clears throat> I think there are many ways we could think about approaching that discussion. But the idea basically is um, most people should be good candidates for going home with the proper support that they need and the like. Uh, we don't want to ignore uh, the proper support argument for it. Um, you know, As we're seeing in the cases of juvenile life without parole, now that states are being required to resentence many of these people convicted in those ways, uh, many of them are getting out and going home after 25 or 30 years in prison. Well, the world has changed a lot in that time. Their families have changed a lot in that time. Uh, we do need tremendous support for people coming home, uh, but that is a problem we could work on, we could resolve in reasonable ways uh, if we had the commitment to doing that. Let me just close with a, a quick story. Um, 
I mentioned <clears throat> that uh, I got my start working on these issues in Michigan uh, several decades ago. Um, I got to uh, spend a lot of time in Jackson Prison, which at the time was described as the largest walled prison in the world. It held 5,000 men. It was sort of straight out of an old Hollywood movie, you know, sort of six tiers. It was dirty, grimy, noisy. Uh, even as a visitor going in, you felt uh, humiliated might be a harsh word, but you felt very, it was a very demeaning experience going through all the security measures and the like. And I was just in and out for the day. Uh, but over a period of time, there was a lifers organization, a group of men who had come together uh, to deal with their situation, to hopefully do some public education, to tell the outside world what it meant to spend, to be sentenced for the rest of your life in prison. So I got to know them uh, quite well. Um, and one day I was talking with one of the guys I knew, um, and he asked me if I knew about the organization Save the Children that you know provides humanitarian relief to kids around the world. And I said, yeah, I, I'm familiar with that. So he said, um, <clears throat> could I get him the address for the organization? And I said, sure, I'll do that next time I come. You know, why do you want the address? Uh, and he said, well, you know, I work in the uh, kitchen here in the prison, and I don't make a lot of money. But at the end of the month, after I spent some money in the commissary and other things like that, I have a little bit of money left over. So I'd like to send $5 a month to save the children. He said, you know, I've been here for 20 years. I committed a murder. That's how I got here. Uh, I've never had a chance to say to anyone, I'm sorry, to say I'm remorseful, to try to pay back to the community. Uh, so in this way, maybe I can do a little something towards that. So what we're doing in our sentencing system, our criminal justice system, we're doing an excellent job of punishing people as much as we can. Uh, we don't do a very good job or even make attempts most of the time in giving people the ability to make those transformations, to reward them for making transformations, to think about what we can do as a community so that we could come out with a better approach overall. Uh, I think if we start to think about a transformed society, a transformed criminal justice system, I think that'll be the best public safety strategy we could come up with, uh, and also one that respects human rights, human beings, and compassion. Thank you very much. Oh, we could do it here? Sure enough, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Good evening, everyone. My name is Radha Natarajan. I'm the executive director of the New England Innocence Project. And um, I'm so happy to be here to have a little conversation um, with Mark about his ideas before we um, bring up our um, wonderful panel, um, who is going to be talking a little bit about um, what's happening locally in Massachusetts about life without parole um, and the impact of these sentences. Um, you know, I want to thank you, first of all, for educating us on so much um, of the data and the information about sentencing that so many people don't know. Um, even those of us who work in the criminal legal system, um, you know, we work um, in those systems without, you know, understanding the history and the background and also comparatively how we function um, uh, as compared to other countries and other jurisdictions. Um, but in reality, um, you know, criminal justice policy seems not to be motivated by data, but rather by emotion, um, fear, um, fear of people who are different, um, racism um, by uh, this idea of who is dangerous and who is not. Um, the idea, um, for example, in a recent death penalty case of whether the question from a juror of whether black people even have souls, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and in addition to that, it is motivated by um, stories of loss, um, um, by victims' families who are angry and want um, someone to pay for that. And so when you're talking about transforming a system and changing criminal justice, um, of course the data is so critical, especially when we don't when we don't know it. Um, but 
How do you advocate for change when so much of criminal justice policy happens, you know, um, based on emotion? Um, can you talk to us about that? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, on the one hand, there's nothing wrong with hearing people's experience with the system, whether they're people in prison, whether victims of crime, you know, whatever uh, professional connections they may have or so. And so I don't have any problem with that. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. When we make public policy based on that, that's, that's when it becomes problematic. Uh, I've sat at congressional hearings and heard members of Congress, who I won't name, say things like when they're considering a certain regressive sensing policy, if this bill would save just one life, then it's absolutely worth it. I mean, here we have a country of 300 million people, and we're going to pass legislation that helps one person, potentially, or at least that's what they're saying. So I think we, we face a big problem there. Uh, I think even more so than the other criminal justice work we do when it's lifers, uh, we have to tell stories also. Uh, people who oppose us are telling stories that uh, generate fear and, and, and stereotypes and all. We have to tell positive stories too. Um, one of the things we've done in the book, if you choose to buy the book, um, is uh, we decided we wanted to tell stories there. So we have six stories interspersed through the book. Uh, the stories were written by uh, Carrie Myers, who did 27 years in Louisiana prison on a life sentence himself and was a prison journalist, award-winning prison journalist. And uh, Carrie and I identified a half a dozen people affected by life sentences, either serving one or family members or others. Uh, and through this, this in our modest way, we're trying to communicate um, the these are real people. Who were they when they were 16 committed this crime? Or when they were the older sister of somebody committed a crime? Who are they today? What is this transformation? And so I think it's a combination of the data and the stories uh, that we need to try to put forth. We have to have the data because we need to convince lawmakers that we're very sound in the research. But we also have to appeal to the heart, too. And I think we can do that. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned a few times about trade-offs, and I think that that happens, um, you know, when sometimes you um, you gain something and then um, there's something to replace it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if there is some success with legislation, so for example, um, in Massachusetts, we're going to be talking about, you know, later on in the panel, um, if there's success in the legislation to. Um, uh, eliminate life without parole. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there it could be replaced, for example, um, with, of course, life. You know, with the possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. And I want um, to ask you, especially as an expert on sentencing, and from my own perspective, um, you know, we are a regional organization. I see both um, people who are sentenced to life without parole, but also people who are on parole for life. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, the impact of what it's like to be on supervision for life. And is that really, um, is that really what we're looking for as the alternative? Can you talk about, um, is that the trade-off that we're hoping for? Um, or are we talking about incremental change? Let's try to um, first um, have people out of prison after 20 years. Let's get there first and then try to get people off these monitoring bracelets and all of that? I mean, what are we hoping for? Yeah. Um, no, I think I, I'm hoping for accomplishing both of those together. Um, yeah, even today, um, you know, states, um, Rhode Island is a good example. Rhode Island, you know, has had very thoughtful corrections leadership for a long time. There's an advocacy community that's been pushing for better policies and the like, and there are many good things to commend it. Uh, but they also have one of the highest supervision rates for people in the community on probation and parole because they have these outrageously long uh, parole supervision periods. And, you know, there too, fortunately, research comes to our rescue. Um, you know, if a person's been on parole for two years or four years or five years and hasn't had any issues, the chances of them being a problem, committing a crime, are quite slim. And there's lots of research to support it. So just from a sort of public policy cost-effective point of view, it's a huge waste of resources to 
keep people on that forever and what does it do to them as individuals thinking that they're constantly under some form of supervision. So I think there's some renewed thinking in the system and some probation parole officials are uh, thinking about changing these kinds of policies but it's, uh, it's inhumane in other kinds of ways too and, and also very ineffective I think too. One of the arguments that you didn't mention tonight um, is that the system that we have that punishes people um, is unreliable. And what I mean by that is that um, our criminal legal system makes a lot of mistakes. Um, it makes mistakes um, in so many different ways. Um, it uh, leads innocent people to plead guilty. It, um, we have ineffective counsel. We have um, faulty science. We have false confessions. We have faulty identifications. I mean, so many things. Um, and we have no idea what um, percentage of our prison population is innocent. And we can't know that um, because we also have a faulty legal system that prevents people from getting justice once um, their convi conviction is final. Um, this, of course, is you know, something of interest to me. Um, it's not to say that we should focus on that because whether you are innocent or guilty, a, um, you know, a life without parole sentence is in unjust and inhumane. But I'm wondering whether um, you think that um, focusing on that is, um, is improper to whether you think as an advocacy, um, what do you think about talking about that? Um, what do you think are the pros and cons of that? Yeah. I, I think it's important in several ways. You know, one, um, I'm sure people have different perspectives. I think, you know, the death penalty in the United States is, is abominable, but it's dying a slow death is how I, I see it. You know, the number of death sentences each year and executions has gone down pretty significantly and it's a relative handful of jurisdictions and prosecutors that are pushing the cases. Um, I think a significant factor has been the documentation of innocence. You know, it's for the last decade or more, you know, once a month or so we see a front page story of somebody who spent 25 years in prison and DNA evidence uh, demonstrated the person uh, was, was not the, the perpetrator or so. Uh, so I think it has been compelling to people who might not share our moral distaste for the death penalty but are, uh, feel uncomfortable doing this. But it also points out for issues of life imprisonment, um, well, for start, the numbers are much more substantial. So we have a little less than 3,000 people on death row, and we have about 50,000 people serving life without parole. Um, as terrible as the death penalty is in terms of resources devoted and legal representation and, and the like, um, at least you have certain protections, theoretically sometimes, in, in death cases. and. Uh, and review and cases go up and down the Supreme Court and you have appellate lawyers getting involved. When it comes to life imprisonment, even those modest protections built in for the death penalty don't exist. So, um, so we don't have the resources to look into how many cases may be innocent of these 50,000 life without parole people. Um, there's every reason to believe that if mistakes are made in death cases which have more scrutiny than anything else, they're probably made at least the same rate, if not more so, in, in life without parole cases uh, with very little uh, advocacy being done around it. So uh, it's potentially a horrendous problem, but it's going to be very difficult to uncover it, I think. So I think that's all the time we have right now, but I think I'm going to ask the, well, I'm going to ask everyone, obviously, to um, give another round of applause to Mark. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to ask our panelists to come up. Um, yes, yes. OK. 
Okay. Um, so I'm just going to ask everyone on the panel to just very, very briefly, um, in like a sentence or two, just to introduce themselves, um, and then um, and then we'll get into it. Um, so well, you already know Mark. So. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica Eagles, and I'm here tonight to speak because my husband is currently incarcerated uh, for life without the possibility of parole, and I'm um, here to advocate for some very important reform for our family and for everybody uh, in similar situations. Hi, my name is Jay Livingstone. I'm a state representative. I represent parts of Cambridge and parts of Boston. And I'm here tonight because I filed legislation this term to end life without parole in Massachusetts. Good evening. My name is Sean Ellis. I am an exoneree. Um, I was, at the age of 19, arrested and eventually convicted um, for murder. Um, as recent as December 17th, um, those convictions was dropped by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and I'm here just to bring light to um, the reality and the effects of life without parole. I'm Rachel Corey from the Emancipation Initiative, with, which organizes with folks on the sentence of life without parole inside Massachusetts prisons. So just so everyone knows how we're going to proceed, um, so I'm going to start actually with Rachel, and um, she has um, something that um, she'd like to read, um, and I'd like to have her sort of start the program, and um, and then I'm going to ask um, Sean to tell um, a little bit of his story, um, and um, and then I'm just going to um, ask Jessica some questions, um, and this is sort of so you have. Um, an understanding of um, some of the impact of um, what we're talking about tonight. Um, and then I'm going to um, ask Representative Livingstone to talk about the legislation, um, the details of it, why he filed the legislation, um, and then um, back to um, Rachel um, to talk about some of the advocacy around this. So that's sort of how we'll proceed as far as the panel. Um, so up here you'll see photos cycling through um, that include folks on life without parole and life with pr the possibility of parole in um, Massachusetts state prisons. And um, I'm just gonna read an excerpt of a slave narrative, which is something that Emancipation Initiative does because we see the direct correlation between this country's founding on violence of indigenous and black people and our current um, prison state. So this is from Derek Washington, who founded Emancipation Initiative. Today, February 7th, 2017, marks my 12th year of slavery, incarceration. I find the disquietude of my many thoughts settling in. I've pondered over my past conversations with other prisoners and thought back to the many men, good men, who have been chewed up by this ogress we call Lady Justice and churned through her digestive tract, ultimately left to dissolve in the bile of her rotten belly. These men have been sanctioned to hopelessness, designated to perish one by one, while others just remained caught in her gastric juices. It was Alamin, a fellow prisoner, who wrote a letter to the common people. He posed such compelling questions that pried at the purpose and functions of our criminal justice system, which stood out when he inquired, what if Malcolm X had been sentenced to life? As he swiftly followed with the query, what would South Africa be like if Nelson Mandela never was released from prison? I proceeded to follow the text as I came across the stammer of his next question with him implying in his disquisition. What if they never let Arnie, Zachariah, Fuquan, or D. Washington out? These are just some of the men he mentioned, including myself, who are currently in the belly of the og this ogress, fighting against the forces working to repress and snuff out the lights of life, liberty, and freedom. Ali Amin's letter hit home, and I was able to garner strength from his writings, as I am confident that this modern practice of American slavery will be assigned an expiration date through the efforts of such men. Thank you. Sean, um, if you wouldn't mind um, telling us um, just a little bit, and I can also ask you some questions, but if you can tell us just a little bit about your story. Um, 
you know, when you were convicted, how old you were, the sentence you got, um, and then we can go from there. Yeah. So as I shared, um, I was 19 years old when I was arrested for the murder of a Boston police detective, um, John Mulligan. Um, I spent approximately two years in county jail um, and ultimately endured three murder trials. Um, that is because the first two trials ended in hung juries um, because the jury did not agree on the verdict. Um, subsequently, I was tried again for at a third trial and I was convicted. Um, for the next 20 years, um, I spent fighting to prove my innocence. Um, I had my direct appeal denied, um, but before my direct appeal was denied, um, prior to my direct appeal, it was discovered that um, key detectives um, that was involved in the investigation was also involved in police corruption. Um, and there was the ones that um, went out and really had a hand in critical evidence that, that, that they developed against me. For example, um, one of the officer's nieces um, is the, the person that identified my, my photograph, um, but she only did so after three attempts. Um, subsequently, my direct appeal was denied, um, and um, I started to lose hope, and uh, I ultimately um, changed lawyers in the new way that I was able to get, um, Rosemary Scalpicio, um, she unearthed uh, further um, corruption of the, 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 the officers involved in the case that the Commonwealth did not turn over. Um, for, for example, um, we discovered a document um, that revealed that one police officer had accused another police officer of the homicide. Um, she went on to discover um, evidence that the, 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 the victim in the case was also um, involved in a corruption ring. Um, none of this stuff was revealed to the defense team prior to trial. Um, and even after once it was revealed to the de de defense team, um, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office at that time um, not only tried to con con not only con concealed it, but um, didn't want to turn it over. And once it was turned turned over, it was like a cat and mouse game, um, so to so to uh, speak. Um, and it wasn't until Judge Carol Ball ordered the District Attorney's Office to dis disclose all the information that they have um, in the case that we started to to to, to learn more um, evidence that that, that was not turned over, and even to this day, now all the evidence in the case has been turned over. Thank you. Um, can you tell us, um, you know, what, if you can, you know, what it felt like to have, to be in prison, to have a life without parole sentence as an innocent man? What did that feel like? Can you give us any, can you, illustrate that for us at all? What comes to my mind in this moment is just really a, a inconceivable um, size boulder just laying on top of you and you can't get it off. Um, that's, that's, that's the most descriptive way that I have to, to, to explain it. But um, when I was in prison, I lost my dad. When I was in prison, I lost my firstborn nephew. Um, when I was in f prison, I lost my favorite aunt. Um, so it's, 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 it's those sorts of things that, um, with the weight of the, the, the imaginable size boulder weighing on you, it's those sorts of things that um, begin, that begin to um, affect my sense of humanity and my sense of hope. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Jessica now, too, um, if you can tell us a little bit about um, the impact of having a loved one who is serving a sentence of life without parole. If I can start there. Um, I think, you know, when you think about it, it's such, it's such a big thing. It's such a heavy thing. Um, and, you know, I was, you know, we were talking about preparing for this event, and, you know, they 
that question was asked. And you have to stop and think about it because when you're living with somebody or living with somebody who's serving life without parole, it becomes part of your life. And then when you take a step back and you look at the heaviness of it, um, it, it can be quite a bit. And so, you know, the response to that really is um, knowing that my husband could die in prison um, and not have the opportunity to come home um, is almost unbearable sometimes. I know that, um, that your husband, I think, um, wanted to share something with, with us, and so I wanted to give you an opportunity sure. to, to do that. <clears throat> Thank you, um, and he, I'm sure, will appreciate that also. So, you know, um, we've talked a lot about this event because um, just because he's incarcerated doesn't mean he's not very much a part of my life, um, and we talk about everything, and um, we were kind of going over some final thoughts last night, and um, as he was sitting on the phone in a room full of probably 30 or 40 guys trying to choke back some tears, um, the thing that he wanted me to share most is that he accepts responsibility for what he has done, uh, for the part that he took in it, um, and that he uh, isn't—he—he he is not the person that he was uh, when his crime occurred, and um, he just really wants people to know that he's not a monster. So I'm going to come back to both of you. Um, I want to um, sort of um, pivot a little bit to um, Jay to talk about um, the legislation. Um, I think you know some of these stories. Um, I think may have motivated you. I don't know. Maybe you can tell us what may have motivated you, but also um, then what is the legislation? What does it do? Sure. Um, actually, one of Mark's comments uh, was uh, hit home. So I was, before I became a representative, I was a prosecutor and uh, also served as a defense attorney. And in the legislature, uh, one of the focus of that is really trying to improve our criminal justice system and bring more justice to the system. And one, the, one of the big efforts in the Massachusetts legislature that was largely successful last term was eliminating uh, nonviolent drug offenses, is mandatory minimums for drug offenses, basically. And I, I think I said nonviolent drug offenses probably a million times in the last um, three or four years. And it's, in last time we were successful in repealing a lot of those. Um, as I was having discussions with my colleagues to talk about those type of sentences, I would um, mention there's a lot of other mandatory minimums that, and once you get out of uh, drug offenses, it, it's really OUI, drunk driving, and, and then violence. And, and it didn't seem to me that um, my colleagues in the legislature were really ready to go to those other places. Um, we had a very successful uh, term last term where we did very comprehensive criminal justice bill that touched almost every aspect of the criminal justice system from uh, police interactions through arrests, through bail, through sentencing, through um, what happens when somebody goes off to jail or is on probation. And, and I, as I was thinking about uh, what to file this term, uh, a constituent of mine who's here, uh, Lori Tamo Berry, uh, started talking about this issue with me. And it, I think my first reaction was that it was very intuitive that you know, no one decades after, decades later is the same exact person that they were decades earlier. I know I am not like I was when I was 20 years old, um, being in my 40s now. And the idea that uh, the state would just be writing off those people um, to just lock them up where there's no possibility that they'll ever get out just struck me as, as wrong. But the more I've looked into what's happening, uh, the more convinced I became that, that I should really be putting effort into this. And it's you know, a quarter of Massachusetts, you know, Mark mentioned one in seven nas nationally, one in seven people 
that's incarcerated is on one of these sentences. In Massachusetts, it's one in four. So it's a big chunk of our prison population. And part of what's driving it is, uh, he also mentioned how uh, difficult politically it's become for governors to commute sentences. And in Massachusetts, that hasn't happened in over 20 years. 1997 was the last time a sentence was commuted. Um, and so, uh, and it, it's not that somebody is going to be released um, at any given point automatically. We have a very rigorous parole process. And, and so what my bill does, uh, and I filed it with Senator Boncori, and there, another two, uh, Senator Will Brownsberger and Representative Dave Rogers have filed very similar bills, um, is guarantee somebody a right to a parole hearing, regardless of what uh, sentence they've been on uh, within 25 years. Sorry, it's not 20. Um, but and that doesn't mean that they'll get released. But if they're ready to be released, they should be. And as you look back at some of the people incarcerated, there's going to be people in jail today that are going to be released very quickly if my bill becomes law. Um, it is a retroactive bill, so it would apply to people currently in prison and going forward. There are people in prison today that used to be released um, in the 1980s and even the 90s on weekend furloughs. There, there have been people that were recommended for commutation after a rigorous review by the parole board over a decade ago who have not done anything to, to accept, continue to show themselves to be model prisoners. And those people right now are doing that despite the fact that there really is no possibility that they'll get out in society. And that to me is an incredible waste. And it's, um, so I'm pleased to, to file this bill. And I've really been excited to, to see the response to it. Um, you know, you never know when you're going to file legislation, uh, what, what people think about it, uh, particularly um, on a subject like this. But, but it, it has, I think, resonated with people just as an issue of fairness that people get an opportunity after a certain time to prove that they should return to society. Rachel, I want to turn to you um, both either about the legislation itself or about other um, advocacy efforts um, in Massachusetts specifically on um, the issue of life without parole? Uh, so I just want to emphasize, if could you bring the photos back up of the folks inside? Um, because that's why I'm involved. I got to know folks inside because I was interested in criminal justice reform and I realized the folks who are most active are the folks with the longest sentences, because they have a lot of time to do and a lot of time with themselves. Um, and that's why I'm here. And they are incredible advocates and incredible organizers. And I just want to emphasize that and how rewarding it is to be in relationship with them to do this work. Um, and so it was really exciting to, so Arnie um, is a guy who has gotten hundreds of furloughs, who has been in our community, who has started programs, who the whole entire parole board said, we believe that you should be released via commutation. And then Deval Patrick let it sit on his desk for years because of political motivations. And Arnie is still in prison 40 plus years after his crime was committed. Um, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so this bill, which just got assigned to the Judiciary Committee, which Rep. Yesterday. Living, yesterday, which Rep. Livingstone is on, which is exciting, the numbers to remember are House 3358 and Senate 826. Um, and I whipped up a letter. It's not the most perfect letter in the world, but it'll do for now. Um, and we had folks handing it out before, and we have more copies at the desk. And we're just asking folks to write their name and address. You don't have to know who your state rep or state senator is with your address. We can sort that out. Um, but then just turn it over and sign it and put your email and phone number on it. And we'll deliver it to your representatives on your behalf. Because um, this is not 
going to win elections right now, at least, until we show the public and show the state legislators that they're support for this. And so I'm really excited that you all are here um, and willing to take action. Emancipation Initiative, um, our two goals are to end the sentence of life without parole and to restore the right to vote to folks in prison because we know the folks most impacted by our policies by our elected officials should have a voice in the who makes those policies and what those policies are. Um, and so to that end, we handed out red flyers because next month <laughs> we're launching Mass Power, which stands for Massachusetts Prisoners and Organizers Working for Enfranchisement and Restoration. Um, this state was the most recent state in 2000 to steal away the right to vote from prisoners. Uh, and we say it's time to give them back. Um, and so we meet bi-weekly because this is going to take a lot of work and a lot of organizing and a lot of coordination, and we would love to see you all there. Um, so that is some of what's going on in this state. I want to ask um, Sean, um, you know, thoughts about the legislation, but um, and it's not specifically a comment on the legislation, but if you were, um, and, and I'm very grateful that you're not, um, since I know you, <laughs> um, but if you were um, still in prison and this was, um, this, you know, it was passed and you were before the parole board, you know, I think you know that um, the parole board requires you to admit guilt um, in order to be um, paroled. Um, so, you know, can you, can you talk about, first of all, what do you think about the legislation, but also that sort of, um, that piece of this, you know? Absolutely. Um, so the bill for me, um, as I you know, heard it, um, it, it, it offers hope. Um, but even beyond the hope, when you look at um, and when you think about the Department of Corrections, um, it has an objective. And the objective of um, the cor correction system is to co correct criminal thinking. And if that's the job of the system, um, then why would there be opposition to supporting such a bill? Um, if, 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 you, if you don't support the bill, what you're really saying is that you don't trust the correction system to do its job. And if that's the case, then there's a bigger issue because there is, there is tons of money that's going into c corrections. Um, and, and so that's a, that's a problem. So the bill needs to be supported. Um, but then also, um, there's another component that um, hasn't been addressed, which is the, the, um, the partnership or the, 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 the superintendent and or the commissioner being a stakeholder in the corrections, in the, in the, uh, the, the rehabilitation of the prisoner. If the superintendent or the commissioner isn't invested in, in the rehabilitation, then a person is just really sitting in prison, just rotting away. Mm. Um, and so that's another piece that needs to be looked at. Um, but what was the other part of the question? I apologize. <laughs> well, that was just about you know parole and you know so yeah. the so, right. So I, don't, I so I'm just wondering you know because in your particular case, correct. you know um, I, I do think I, you know it's important that the legislation gives hope and I yes. think that's really critical. So I'm just wondering whether you think it would have given you hope. So as you said, um, when when you go before the parole board, um, there's a need to admit guilt. Um, and I was released from prison in 2015. And at some point um, in the summer of 2015, I got a phone call um, from my attorney saying that the Commonwealth had offered me a plea to plead guilty to time served. Um, and the case would be done and over with. And I wouldn't have to concern myself with going back to prison for the rest of my life. And unequivocally, I told her, no, I would not accept that deal. So if I had to sit before the parole board and admit guilt, knowing that I was innocent, then I would be in prison. And so that's a piece that needs to be co corrected. Um, one of the men that Rachel mentioned, uh, Fu Kwan, um, who, who's, who's, 
whose honorable name is Ricky McGee, uh, he was very instrumental to, to my growth and development and my, my maintaining a degree of hope. Uh, because while I, was, while, while I sat in prison, I wrestled with suicidal thoughts. I wrestled with the thought of just wanting to live. Uh, be, be, because I live in a country that's, that's this, 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 the system is supposed to advocate justice, and I got everything other than justice. Jessica, I want to ask you what this legislation means to you, what it means to your family, um, what it means to your husband. Sure. Yeah. This legislation gives our family hope. Um, first and foremost, and it gives hope to uh, many families who are in similar s situations. I think hope is kind of the word of the night, but it really does. Um, and my husband has accepted for a long time that he may never come home, and um, he's a very reserved man, and he's not um, one for many words, but when he speaks, it's pretty important. And um, you know, he's always very careful to say that he doesn't picture himself being home someday uh, because he knows he's serving a life sentence. But he has quiet hope, which is that it's just a little piece of something that he holds on to. And, um, you know, one of the things that um, we've talked about, um, you know, in our relationship and in our marriage is that um, we've kind of promised each other we'd never give up hope. And it's really nice that this legislation is that tangible form of hope for us and for my husband. Thank you. I think this is a good time to get questions, and this is for both all the local panelists as well as Mark, too. Oh, I'm supposed to say, wait. All forms of payment will be accepted for Mark Maurer's book at $22.37. <laughs> and now we'll go on to questions. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'm curious, anyone else to, uh, are there any creative ways going on in the country of getting people up close to the people they fear, i.e. murderers? Because most of us are afraid of people. We read about them in the paper and that's really all we think. We don't see the lifers who have been in 25 years. You saw them at uh, Jackson Prison. I saw them actually in 1971 too at Jackson Prison when I was 25 years old. I got to go in for the summer. I had a job for Michigan State. I met the same lifers they seem like pretty good people to me. I actually brought my softball team, my winning softball team from Michigan State in to play them. And we had an amazing game and an amazing conversation afterwards. But most people don't come close to that. The only guy I remember recommending that high school students go regularly into visit prisons was the most famous psychiatrist in America, Carl Menninger, who back 50 years ago said just that. We need, he wrote a book, The Crime of Punishment, pretty catchy title, and he said we need to make this part of a high school curriculum that people have to go into prison and visit and see for themselves that the people they fear are not people to be feared, but how, is anybody doing anything like that? Um, yeah, I tried something like that way back, and other people are too. Um, when I visited in Jackson Prison and met with the lifers, uh, you know, they basically said, we want to get the message out about who we are today, and obviously they couldn't leave the prison. So we jointly set up a program where once a month on a Saturday afternoon, I would bring in a group of 15 or 20 community people, some from a church, some from social clubs, neighbors, whatever so, uh, most of whom had never been inside a prison. And we'd spend two hours uh, meeting with the lifers. And the first half was sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation. Then we had a group conversation and all. Uh, and then afterwards, we went out to get some coffee and talk about it. And I think it's fair to say 
regardless of their political orientation or anything else going in, every last one of them said, you know, how transformative the experience was for them. That uh, very simple understanding, right, that before that, we define these people by the crime they committed. They're murderers and robbers, as they're typically described in newspaper articles. And here they got to understand, it shouldn't be a surprise, they're human beings who've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Some of their mistakes are bigger than most of ours. Nonetheless, they have their positive sides, their negative sides. They're people in in movement or through life and trying to do that. Um, so uh, I've always said that you know if we could force every American to spend two hours inside a prison talking with prisoners, talking with guards, talking with everybody who works there, I think we'd have a very different national conversation about these issues. Uh, we can't force people to do that, but we can tell the stories through books and movies and uh, our own personal experiences. And I think uh, that that's why it's important, as well as you know having people people like we have on the panel here, uh, being a, having the courage to get up and tell their stories as well. Hello. Um, would the panel support the abolishment of prison, period? Mm, that's a good question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For me, um, Initially, no, um, because there has to be a checks and balance. Um, if somebody does wrong, then um, there has to be some way, shape, or form in which um, uh, some degree of, of, of corrections is done. Um, but that is the ultimate hope. The ultimate hope is the abolishment of prison. Um, but before we can talk about the abolish the abolition of prison, we have to we have to we have to begin a more broader discussion dealing with restorative justice. Because without restorative justice, we can't get into prison ab ab abolishment. Um, just to speak to that too, um, I'm kind of in, in agreement with Sean um, quite a bit on that one. And if I could speak for my husband, he would say. Um, very plainly that he deserved to be where he is for what he did, but not for the rest of his life. And just to add on to my one word answer, <laughs> uh, I think we need to address all forms of violence and we have decided this interpersonal violence is what needs to be the focus, uh, but this country was founded on violence and that's, why Harvard exists and why a lot of other places exist. And so we need to reckon with that before we can pin all the violence and harm um, onto people that we put out of sight and out of mind. Okay, this question is actually from my husband, Alamine, who Rachel spoke of in her reading. He's at MCI Norfolk for Rep Livingstone. And his question is, can you foresee any negative impacts that a bill like this can have on black and brown people when looking at litigation circumstances, particularly in urban neighborhoods with high gang violence with many other young males committing murders at such young ages very often? I th so, it, um, you know, it, there's various interests that are always being balanced with respect to any sentence that we have. And, and I think in the legislature, our job is, is to find the right balance. Um, you know, there are, there are communities in Boston where there are, or there are communities in Massachusetts where the rate of violence yeah is significantly higher than, than others uh, where the criminal justice system is impacting a significantly higher percentage of the population. And I think um, what I, the way I try to think about it is how, how can we get the best results for society? Uh, thinking about not only um, the, the defendants and their families, but the victims and, and their families. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of things that we as a legislature need to do to improve the lives of people in Massachusetts, particularly in 
um, some of these some communities that are greater impacted. I think I'm comfortable with the balance that, that's being struck where uh, with the bill that I, I proposed where people who commit have been convicted of committing an atrocious act or a series of acts um, will get a chance to show that they deserve to go back to the to the community and, and I think um, I don't think those communities that they return to uh, are going to be negatively impacted by that. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, so there's been like something that's been going through my mind. You're talking a lot about um, like murders and um, theft, but you haven't really talked about people who are in prison for rape or sexual assault or pedophilia. And I think that pedophilia, for example, is something that grows with age. And you were talking about um, offenders that then when they grow, they um, reflect on their actions and regret them. I don't think that happens for pedophilia, for example. And I was just wondering, do you really think that, um, like, how do you decide who gets to come out after 20 years? Like, how does that, how would that work? And like, for, for those particular cases, for example. Thank you. No, you're absolutely correct that, you know, we can't say across the board in all crimes, all people's risk of being involved is diminished substantially in 20 years, so particularly for sexual offenses. Uh, I don't pretend to be an, an expert on understanding, diagnosing sexual offending. Uh, clearly, it's a very severe problem. Uh, I think we have people who do know a lot more than I do about diagnosing, assessing, analyzing uh, people's behavior and making reasonable assessments of the danger to the community, the risk to the community. And so uh, rather than have a parole board that's, uh, you know, maybe in some cases, you know, made up of law enforcement people or people don't have those sort of psychological skills, uh, I think we need people who can make uh, the best uh, assessments that we know how to do to make that determination. And uh, we do know there's a broad spectrum of sexual offending, um, you know, with peeping toms at one end and serial rapists at the other and a lot in between. So we need people who can help us make those distinctions and, and tell us what the, the risk levels are there. And I think that's how we'd want to approach that. And just to briefly add on to that, um, folks convicted of sex offenses and homicide are the lowest to reoffend if they're caught. Um, and there's a lot of sexual harm that is not prosecuted that I think could be addressed in ways besides incarceration. I'm going to be very short with my thing. I spent 37 years in prison, and one of the things that gave me hope is guys like you having programs like this, and that's what give guys hope on the inside. Whenever they read and talk about stuff like this, it make them go to the library, it make them do a lot of things that they wouldn't normally do. And this is hope. Right now, this is hope for everybody in the joint. And when they find out about this, they'll be working their butt off to get out. Uh, before we move on to the next question, um, it, it's to get back to your question, um, I was sexually abused as a child. Um, it's something that I really don't speak about. Um, but what I've, what I've learned um, is that, that hurt people hurt people. And so as a society, um, like we need to do a better job of addressing the, the, the hurt that we experience so that we don't con, con, con continue to transfer that hurt on to other people. So I just wanted to add those comments to what Rachel said. All right, so you mentioned the story of Robert Straub, which many people know, but not many people know the story of his victims. Uh, certainly, uh, they're not coming home at night either. So I'm wondering whether you're actually giving enough weight uh, to the interests of the victims, because uh, the criminal justice so-called system is not just about 
uh, corrections and rehabilitation. It's also about uh, punishment and, and retribution. And uh, I think we should uh, strike a balance here because uh, you and no one on the panel really is representing the interests of uh, victims. Although the person on the end did say that her husband deserved to be there. And I think that's a great admission on his part and something we should also keep in mind, don't you? Well, let me start to respond. Um, I think, for one thing, I think we sometimes make artificial distinctions between victims and offenders as if these are two different, very different kinds of people. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's much more fluid than that. Um, I think many of us have committed offenses, could be illegal, and many of us have been victims. Um, I've been, had a career working for what I hope are better public safety approaches in criminal justice. I've also had friends who've been victims of violent crimes and other crimes who've suffered quite a bit too. Um, I do the work I do because I think it will help to produce fewer victims if we have better criminal justice policies, uh, and that's a direction that we want to go. Um, you know, we, people need to be a accountable for the crimes they commit, the antisocial behaviors they commit. I don't have any problem with that. Um, what does that accountability look like? What are we trying to accomplish with it? Um, is it solely based on punishment? Is it based on restoration of them, transformation and the like? I think those are the questions that I would want to ask uh, in terms of how we proceed there. Uh, and also to make clear, <clears throat> we don't do a terribly good job of meeting the needs of victims, either through the criminal justice system or through other means. Uh, people have talked about restorative justice, which certainly has potential for speaking much more directly to those needs. It's still an uphill battle to get those perspectives incorporated in how we deal with the criminal justice system. But I think uh, we have a variety of goals here, and we need to be very strategic and thoughtful in how we try to, to meet the needs of all people who come in across the way. If I can add on to that, <clears throat> um, with all due respect, um, I spent 22 years in prison for a crime that I did not commit. I didn't do anything to anyone. And so, um, although I don't like to use the word victim, I'm a victim of the system. And if the system, if the Commonwealth for Massachusetts was to have been put before a parole board, right, they would not have been let out of prison because they opt not to admit the wrong that they've done to me. So, so when, when, when we speak about the interest of the victim, that's, that, that's where I'm coming from and what I'm, and, 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 and my, the positions that I take. And I do want to speak, there is a lot of harm, and I do want to speak to that just briefly, I'm sorry. Um, the Alliance for Safety and Justice, which is a national organization, uh, did the most comprehensive survey of survivors and victims of violence and found that they want shorter sentences too. They want those funds reinvested towards prevention so that there are not more victims. Um, Daniel, Danielle Sered, who runs Common Justice in Brooklyn um, and New York, uh, who herself is a victim of a violent crime, Common Justice works with victims who want to engage in the restorative justice program, pro process um, who are victims of violent crime. There's a wide breadth of experiences for victims, and there's some very vocal folks who call for more punishment who are victims, but there are a lot more victims who have a more nuanced approach. Hi, um, so my question is, you mentioned that you, there's a form or something that we can put our names and addresses on. Is there anything else we can do to help what you guys are doing? Like, is there any protests, um, you know, rallies, stuff like that, anything that we can help with? Uh, yeah, it's not glamorous, but there's meetings. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we also run something called Donate Your Vote, um, which is a way we creatively re-enfranchise folks in prison um, until we restore the right to vote. And so you can check out emancipationinitiative.org and um, go, t like, come talk to us afterwards, because we can all do a whole lot. Yeah, there's also going to be a hearing 
held on this bill. It, that hasn't been set yet. It, as it was mentioned, it was assigned to the Judiciary Committee yesterday. Um, but you can testify, you can submit testimony to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, you can write a letter to uh, in your a letter to the editor in your local newspaper. Uh, you can talk to your friends about it. You can get them to submit testimony to talk to their representative, to talk to their senator, um, and just be engaged on the on this issue by raising the awareness of it. If I could just add too, uh, along with uh, publication of the book, we also launched a campaign on life imprisonment, and I encourage you to go to our website, endlifeimprisonment.org, for news and events and information uh, about what we can do to end life imprisonment. And I, I just yeah. wanted to add, um, in terms of what you can do, um, and, and as Rachel was saying, it's not glamorous, it's not sensational work. Sometimes it's the quiet, um, work that you do that's just as important. I'd like to speak to some of my friends in the audience whose family are also incarcerated. And um, our advocacy just started with us talking to each other and getting the word out there. Um, so it's not always glamorous, and sometimes it's just educating people. So this is going to be the last question, so we have time for $22.97. And also for you looking at this wonderful artwork. So you can talk to the panelists afterwards. We'll have 15 minutes in this room. And um, here, <clears throat> here is the last question. Five minutes, no. Uh, so uh, I heard someone raise a very important question about sex offenders and the screening of sex offenders. Um, the Department of Correction already has a facility, the treatment center in Bridgewater where sex offenders have to go to before they go to the parole board. So, but, but people ask about how can they get involved? Very simple. Go to mass.gov.com and look up parole hearings. There's, these parole hearings are free to the public, and this is a way that you educate yourself about just what the parole system is, what Massachusetts parole system, the actual screening of parole, and how people, what people have, the process that people have to go through to win their freedom. I mean, this is a three, four hour, uh, thing and the average person don't get it the first time. So I suggest that everybody in this room make a commitment to go to Natick and really sit and listen to an actual parole hearing. Okay. That wasn't a question, Don, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, let's give a big round of applause for everyone.